Good morning. Welcome to Providence United Methodist Church. Grateful and delighted that you have decided to plug in this morning to our service. I know that there are many of you who are watching TV and seeing the riots all across the country. And I say to you, to every physical thing that happens in the world, there must be a spiritual response. It's high time to pray. And we need to pray for the healing of our world, for the healing of broken hearts. So let us pray. Most gracious God, I, I know that this is unnerving to see the unrest, the riots, the looting, and all of these things that are going on, but we pray on one accord, and we ask that you bring a moratorium to all of this hatred that's going on in the world. We pray, Lord, that our spiritual power will bring this into subjection. Lord, we need you. We need you to stir our hearts. We need you to show us the error of our ways. Father, we pray for our government and our leaders, and we pray for your wisdom. And we pray that you would lead them and you would guide them. These things we pray, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I just wanted to say a prayer in the beginning because I know that this is on our minds and our hearts and I want that as we go into worship that we will have been set free of this burden and we will have given the burden to our God. For those who are plugging in, ProvidenceUMC.net slash live is the quickest way that you can get to us. I want to share a story with you very quickly before I get into the call to worship. Two men are good friends. They are golfing buddies. And for whatever reason, they decide that they want to talk theology. And the one friend says to the other friend, do you know the Lord's Prayer? And the friend says, of course I know the Lord's Prayer. He said, man, you don't know the Lord's Prayer. He says, I know the Lord's Prayer. My mother taught me the Lord's Prayer. My grandmother taught me the Lord's Prayer. I'll bet you $10 you don't know the Lord's Prayer. I'll take that bet. He says, all right, say the Lord's Prayer. And the man said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And his friend laughed and said, wow. Takes out $10 and he hands it to his friend and says, I didn't know you knew it. Here's the story. Both men did not know the Lord's Prayer. But if you continue to plug into Providence United Methodist Church, we're going to teach you the word of God. You're going to learn the word of God. If you stay with us for one year, I guarantee that your life will be changed. I'm trusting in God. I hope that you are also trusting in God. Please join me in our call to worship. With tongues of flame, the Holy Spirit descended, descends to burn in our hearts anew. Unite us, Holy Spirit. Like the rush of wind, we sense God's presence blowing afresh throughout the world. Unite us, Holy Spirit. Across the barriers of language and culture, Christ's message of love and grace is heard. Unite us, Holy Spirit. Divine advocate, we seek your guidance as we search for your spirit of truth. Unite us, Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, ignite within us a fiery passion for your mission in the world today. Warm us by the Spirit's dancing tongues of flame that we may feel your kindling blaze within us, urging us to do your greater good. Make us wholly present to experience a new birth and an awakened possibilities within us to share your love in the world. In this love and abundance, we come to celebrate your harvest. 
a harvest bearing the first fruits of the Spirit within us. Show us how to use these gifts as we listen for your truth in the gentle breeze of your Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. Our first song is found in our hymnal, 393, Spirit of the Living God in Fullness. So on Pentecost today, we are reflecting on the importance of the Holy Spirit and what a difference that should make in our everyday lives, knowing that when Jesus was taken back up into heaven, he did not leave us orphans, as the word says, but we've been given a comforter and a guide. And I just want to read out of Romans 8. Um, The whole chapter is amazing. So if you have not read Romans 8 recently, I highly encourage it because it's all about what living in the Spirit is about. And Paul writes that if you are in the flesh, um, then you're not in the spirit because the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And so it says, then brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So think about that this week. If you're being led by the Spirit of God, if you're walking in life and peace, those are evidences of living by the Spirit.
Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Mary Elliott, and I am the president of the United Methodist Women here in Providence. I'm grateful to be here this morning, and I'm very grateful for Derek's words at the beginning of the service. Um, I've watched the news the last couple days, and I've kept up with everything, and my heart is broken. My heart is broken for those people that don't think that they're being heard. And my heart is broken for those good police officers who are tainted by the bad ones. And I am so grateful for the people that get out there and march and let their voices be heard. I'm pretty sure if it wasn't for people like you, Pastor Derek wouldn't be our preacher. And I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. So I'm very grateful for you. And I just wanted to say that. Billy Graham's daughter, Ann Graham Lotz, has put out a special call for the women of the church and the women of this nation and of this world to have a special prayer time tonight. The um, website that you can go to is turntojesusprayer.com. I'll share it later on my Facebook page if you'd like to watch her video on it. It's, it's a very sweet video, and it talks about how the women around Jesus um, played such a big role in his ministry. And she has asked all the women, the men too, um, to come together at a special time tonight to pray. Based on your time zone, tonight in the Eastern time zone, it's from 8 to 9, and she has just asked for all the women to pray for our nation. So I'll share that later. And she says, what a better day to pray than on the day God poured out his spirit on us on Pentecost. So now I'm going to give you the children's message. <laughs> I, so a couple weeks ago when I did the children's message on Mother's Day, I told you how much I loved pink and that pink was my favorite color. And I got home and my um, two adult daughters watched the video and they were like, Mom, I feel like our whole life has been a lie. We always thought your favorite color was red. And, <laughs> and I think they're right. I think I do have two favorite colors. So um, I was grateful today to come in here and see all the red and um, to be able to, red, to wear red this morning in um, honor of Pentecost and how um, it just signifies God's spirit flowing down on us. Have you ever been in a restaurant and it's really loud? There's a lot of people in there. I know we haven't been in there a while, but back when you were, um, there's a lot of noise and a lot of people talking and everything's really loud. And then this poor waitress drops her tray and it just goes crash on the floor. And everything gets silent. Everybody can hear everybody talk again. And everybody's looking around, going on, seeing what's happening. Or have you ever gotten ready? Have you ever been out on your front porch or your back porch and you see that thunderstorm rolling in and you just, and the breeze calms and everything around you is quiet? It's just that stillness. And that's kind of how I think that that morning in Pe at Pentecost was. Um, people were, the guys were sitting around talking and they were like, what do we do next? You know, what have we done? What has God given us? What? And that fire and that wind came through and the Holy Spirit was just, just overflowing. And it overflowed so much that people came running, wondering what it was. You know, it wasn't just the disciples. It was people all around. They were wondering what was going on. And it was God's Holy Spirit filling those people up and therefore filling us up with the Holy Spirit to continue to do God's work. I'm so grateful for that, and I hope you are too. It took me a long time to understand what Pentecost was about, and now that I know it, I just want to tell everybody about it. <laughs> and I wanted to tell you about it this morning. So let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for bringing your Holy Spirit to comfort and to teach us. Help us to teach others about your love. Amen. Our first reading comes from the Old Testament, Psalm 104, verses 24 to 34 and 35b. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, creeping things innumerable are there, living things, both small and great. 
There goes the ships and the Levathons that you have formed and sported it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. And when you give to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renewed the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth, and it trembles, who touches the mountains, and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul, Bless the Lord. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading, the hearing of God's holy word. May it sink deep down and bring forth much fruit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading comes from the New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 22. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that they hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and all parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, no. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, I will pour, I mean, in the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great glorious day. Then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading the hearing of God's holy word. May it sink deep down and bring forth much fruit. The word of God for the people of God. This is the story of Pentecost. He touched me. And all the joy that floods my soul. 
something happened, and now I know he touched me, and he made me whole. I want to challenge your thinking this morning with a thought touched by the Holy Spirit. Touched by the Holy Spirit. I like listening to other preachers in the morning and it gets me started. And I was listening to Rick Warren and he shares that life is about choices. We make a choice and then the choice makes us. In other words, when we make a good decision, it puts us on the path to being successful. When we make a bad decision, it takes us away from a path of success. Every decision that we make has a consequence. And being human, the potential for error is great. Therefore, we need the Holy Spirit. We constantly struggle in our decision-making. We struggle with decisions in marriage. We struggle with decisions in parenting and schooling. We labor over where to live, where to move, what job to take. We struggle to care for our grandchildren, our adult parents. Life is about a series of decisions. However, Indecision is one of the greatest struggles and stressors in our lives. Indecision, indecisiveness. When we get to that place, we're being led by fear, by doubt, by timidity, by hesitancy, being Indecisive is when we are ambivalent to the will of God. And wavering shouldn't be in our Christian walk. We should not waver. And that's not where God wants us to be, plagued by indecisiveness. Worried about should we go left or should we go Right. Therefore, God has sent the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the intercessor, to lead and to guide us to right paths for his name's sake. Listen to the story of Pentecost and hear a little bit about the gift of this spirit. The book of Acts opens with the story of the disciples of Jesus and their travels. It's about the organization of the early church. It's about their mission to convert Gentiles. It's about the disciples carrying out the great commission of Christ. Go therefore and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. You see, Pentecost is about obedience and not indecision. Again, in the book of Acts, it opens with the disciples becoming unified in Jesus. But remember, they asked Jesus, is this the time that you will restore Israel? And Jesus responds by saying, it's not for you to know the signs of the times nor the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. And then he adds these words. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses and Judea, and Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. Pentecost is about 
the disciples' obedience and not about indecision. Soon after Jesus said these words, he was lifted up right in front of them. But for the first time after the resurrection, there they stood in unity. My first point this morning comes in verse 1. Unity is being on one accord. Listen to the verse. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Unity is a word that we often throw around in the church. But what exactly does it mean to be unified as the body of Christ? And how can we foster this sense of unity? I want you to know that each one of us has a role to play and each one of us can gain much when we are unified in Christ. What does it mean to be unified with people who are different from you, different from me? Unity in the church is about coming together to form something much larger than ourselves. It's recognizing that we are stronger together than we could ever be individually. We are stronger together than we could ever be individually. It's enjoying the fellowship with each other. Unity in the church doesn't necessarily happen automatically. As with any relationship, we have to work continually at building and maintaining unity. Ephesians 4 and 3 says it like this, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Why were they together in one place? Jesus told them to wait in one place for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And their waiting and watching together was a sign of unity. Somebody say unity. We need it. And even though we might disagree on some things, we need to be unified as the body of Christ. We need unity. No matter how many differences you and another Christian may have, we are unified in the fact that we all belong to this spiritual family. We've been adopted into the body of Christ. You don't have to like me, but you do have to love me. We've been adopted as the body of Christ. I don't have to like you, but I do have to love you. Somebody ought to say amen. The phrase, no man is an island, is not found in the Bible, but it certainly goes a long way with what the word of God has to say about people and our need to be unified. You may be thinking, well, I'm an introvert or I'm an extrovert. I'm an independent person. It's fine. And you may do your own thing. You might read a book. You might like your quiet time. But here's what I want you to hear. Not even the most introverted of us, introverted of us would do well living in isolation. We need each other. And we need to be unified. We need each other to help work through difficult seasons like this season we're in and like these times that we're in. We need each other, even when there's something to rejoice. Don't you want to go and tell somebody about the good news? We need each other. We also need each other to pray for one each other, for one another. And so that we can see maybe sides of ourselves that we can't see, the places where we need to grow. I'm so glad that I've got people around me who are willing to share that with me, to share the sides of myself that possibly I cannot see. When we acknowledge our need for each other and do our best to live in community, it becomes the foundation 
for unity. And when we work on one accord and allow the Spirit to touch us, we too will sing this chorus. I'm just going to say the words. We're going to sing it on the last note, but I just want to say the chorus one time for us again. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me, and he made me whole. My second point comes with verses 2 to 4. Touched by the Spirit. Listen to the word. And suddenly from heaven there came the sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave ability. The scripture says those who followed Jesus up to the ascension were about 120 in number. They were there for the festival of Pentecost, which was their tradition. But they were not the only ones there. People from many nations had come. Jews from all over the nation were there outside of this huge house where they were, and suddenly, from heaven, the Spirit fell. Apparently, the Spirit must have moved them outside because everyone experienced this phenomenon. They were speaking with one voice, but those who listened heard the message in their own native tongue. How could this be? Imagine with me. Imagine being at the United Nations for a huge meeting where one person is speaking and everyone in attendance puts on a headset and they listen to a translator speaking in their own tongue. But remember, this is a long time ago, thousands of years ago, there was no telephone. There were no headphones. It was the Holy Spirit who was the translator. Somebody say amen. The Holy Spirit is still our translator even today, and it translates our prayers to God. How many of you know sometimes when even when we don't have words and we maybe just have a groan or a pain that the Holy Spirit interprets that groan and that pain up to God the Father. When the Holy Spirit shows up, there are no barriers. When the Holy Spirit shows up, our language is not hampered by vocabulary, by syntax, the conjugation of verbs, dialect, accent, present or past tense. God language knows no limits. When God speaks, everyone listens. All of creation listens. And how can we recognize the voice of God? This question has been asked by countless people throughout the ages. You will remember with me in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 and 10, Samuel heard the, ver the voice of God, but he didn't recognize it until he was instructed by Eli. You will remember with me in Judges 6, chapter 6, verses 17 to 22 and 36 through 40, Gideon had a physical revelation from God, and yet he still doubted what he had heard to the point that he asked for a sign not once, but three times. How many of you know that the Holy Spirit is key? When we are listening for God's voice, how do we know that God is speaking? The Holy Spirit is key. 
First of all, we have something that Gideon and Samuel did not have. When we look at Samuel and we look at Gideon, the Holy Spirit will come upon them for a time to do a particular work. But what's different about us, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was deposited into the life of every believer. What we have that Samuel and Gideon didn't have, we have the entire Bible, the inspired word of God to read, to study, to meditate on. All scripture is God breathed and it is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correction, for training in righteousness so that men and women of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let me be emphatic. To hear God's voice, we must belong to him. Amen? Jesus said, said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Those who hear God's voice are those who belong to him those who've been saved by his grace through faith and our Lord Jesus Christ, these are the sheep who hear and recognize the voice of God because they know him as their shepherd. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. David knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he belonged to God. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me. And he made me whole. My last point comes in verses 5 through 13. When the Holy Spirit comes, not everyone will be in agreement. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under the heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered, and they were bewildered because each one heard them speaking in their native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are these men who are speaking not Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia? Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and all parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. I just want to say that's a lot of folk. And in our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But here's what I want you to hear. But others sneered and said, ah, they're filled with new wine. When people don't understand something, they twist the facts. They begin to speculate. They start creating rumors. Those who the Holy Spirit had passed up, we don't know for what reason. Scripture doesn't tell us. But they began to accuse the ones who had been touched by the Holy Spirit as drunk on new wine. But here's a great lesson for us this morning. 
And that lesson is, if you are a believer in Christ, everyone is not for you. That's a hard thing to learn because we just want to love everybody, but everybody is not for us. Let me ask a question. When you gave your life to the Lord, when you became a Christian, was everybody excited for you? It's just a question. When I gave my life to the Lord, there was a whole lot of misunderstanding. My friends didn't know what to think, what had happened to me. And everybody was not for me. Anyone who tells you that committing your life to Christ makes your life easy is not telling the truth. Giving my life to the Lord was fulfilling, yes. More joyful, absolutely. But easier, no. You giving your life to the Lord, it won't be easy, but it will be the, the greatest thing that you've ever done. But giving your life to the Lord does mean that more challenges are going to come your way and struggles will come. It means the more that we come in touch with ourselves and we learn about sin, laziness, gluttony, swearing, anger, self-centeredness, materialism, covetedness, temptations, they seem to never end. The world and the flesh and the devil don't go away simply because you said, I'm a believer. Hello, somebody. But struggles will come. And that's why we need the gift of this Holy Spirit. Being a Christian is difficult because once we say that we belong to Christ, now we're suddenly swimming upstream against the current, against the current of the world. And my friends, we need the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us to do this. Being a Christian is difficult because it requires growth. God loves us too much to let us stay the same. Growth can be painful at times and usually we don't like to leave our comfort zones. The greatest growth I've ever experienced in my life has come through struggle. Because it was in the struggle that I realized that I needed God the most. It was in the struggles that I prayed more, that I cried more, that I got alone more. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The greatest struggles or the greatest growth in my life came through struggle. And as we grow in Christ, we realize that God is not desirous of our conforming to a set of rules. He wants our hearts. He wants all of us. I was just thinking, what if we as the body of Christ, who now possess this deposit of the Holy Spirit living in inside of us, if we got together on one accord and began to pray about what's going on in the world, about these riots, about racism, about those who don't know Christ, if we got together and began to pray on one accord, what could happen? You see, this is what Jesus wanted for the disciples. He wanted them to be unified. He wanted them in one place. He wanted them to receive that deposit of his spirit so that the comforter, the intercessor, could come and teach them how to please the Father. When the Holy Spirit descended upon the believers at Pentecost, it was not a quiet event but it was a powerful one. It was a phenomenon to behold. 
the miraculous speaking in foreign tongues, which enable people from various language groups to understand the single message of the disciples. It was a phenomenon to behold. And then came the bold. Decisive. Notice I said decisive, not indecisive, but the bold, decisive preaching of Peter to this Jewish community. The effect of the sermon was so powerful as the listeners were cut to the heart that Peter instructed them to repent and to be baptized. The result ended in a mega church. It resulted in over 3,000 that were added to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, to the prayers and the signs and wonders. I want you all to come back and sing with me this last time he touched me, just the chorus. Listen, this is what I want for you. I want the Holy Spirit to touch your life. I want you to cry out to God. And when you do, and you invite God in, and ask God to take over your life, you too will begin to sing this chorus. Most gracious God, we know that your spirit is alive and it's real. Touch every heart, hearts that are here, hearts that are watching, hearts that will plug into this even later. And if they don't know you in the pardon of their sins, I pray, Lord, that you might prick their hearts and let them say this prayer. Lord, I need you. Come into my life. Give my life meaning and give my life purpose. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you have a place for me. Come now, Lord, and be the Lord of my life. And Lord, we know that if they say that prayer, they will never be the same. All of this in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to say to to those who continue to bring your offering to the church, those who continue to mail in your offerings, how grateful we are. Things have to continue even with this new normal. And so I want to say thank you, but I want to continue to pray over all the gifts that continue to come here at Providence. Lord, we pray for your faithful, for those who continue to Bless us with their gifts. Father, we even thank you for those who are making sacrificial gifts, even as I'm praying. And those who haven't, but those who will. And Lord, we pray that when it comes, that you will take it, bless it, and break it. And that it might feed the multitude who stand in need of this ministry. We pray it to be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Our last song can be found in hymn 347, Spirit Song.
pray today something said has been meaningful for you. Pray that even as you are viewing us and listening, I pray that you've been touched by the Spirit today. Pray that God will fill you in every way. Please receive your benediction. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift your countenance and grant us all God's great peace. Please be at peace. Amen. Thank you.